exponential growth and decay, applications and graphing of the functions. So first we're going to graph exponential growth functions, then an exponential decay function, show you what the difference is, and then we're going to talk about the different types of growth and decay equations that you would use for applications. So starting with 2 to the x, um, generally you use 2 to the x and a half to the x, basically because the numbers are manageable. You don't want to be dealing with 5 to the power of 3, which obviously was going to be 125, and it's not something your teachers can ask you to graph, hopefully. So if we take a look at 2 to the x, we've already done this before. Um, don't forget when you raise something to a negative power, it does not make a negative number, but I would say 2 to the power 3, which is 8, and the negative to me would say I put 1 over my answer. So that's 1 8. 2 squared is 4, 1 over it, a quarter, a half. 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 4, 8. So there's my coordinates if I wanted to graph 2 to the x. And I'm going to. It's not going to be extremely accurate because it's hard to graph a quarter, an eighth, a half. Zero, one is two, two is four, three is eight. So the reason they call this exponential growth, obviously, is because as we read the graph from left to right, it gets higher. So these are things that grow rapidly. And examples of that would be um, something like cell division. You learned in biology, right? You start with two cells, they split to four, they split to eight, they split to 16, they split to 32. So you're getting a doubling effect. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Don't forget, you should always write your asymptote on the line. This, of course, is y equals zero. There has been no vertical shift of my graph. We're graphing basic parent functions. So if we go over to the half power, so half to the power of x, or 0.5 to the x, is the same thing. And if I do a half to the power of 3 and 1 over that, that means I can take, oh, let me write it here, so I could write it as a half to the negative 3 is the same thing as 2 to the power of 3. Remember with your exponents, if you have fractions, you can flip it and change the sign. Because basically it means I'm doing a half to the power of 3, which is an eighth, and then I'm flipping it, which gives me 8. So a half to the negative 3 is 8, to the negative 2 is 4, to the negative 1 is 2. And as you can see, this is going backwards from the other one a half, a quarter, one eighth. So when you go to graph these, this time you're starting with your highest point here. And we come down, one, two, zero, and then I have a half, a quarter, an eighth. And I still have my asymptote because I never crossed the line y equals zero. So this is what we call a decay function. Decay means to rot away, doesn't it? Get smaller and smaller. So this is my decay graph. This is my growth graph. So not only do you have the graphs and the, of the functions that you can do to show growth and decay, we have equations that talk about different types of growth. So we're going to start with the growth equations first. I'm going to explain them um, fairly quickly. Uh, the equations are pretty basic and as long as you understand what, what they're saying in the equation, I don't think you'll have any trouble with this. So if we have something like cell division, which is the one I just explained with the graph above, because it is with a base of 2. So base of 2, as you can see, as I go up, I'm actually doubling the number, an eighth to a quarter to a half, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. I'm doubling. So that's something that you would use often for cell division. And the equation looks like this. You have a population at some time t, remember this is like a function notation, right? Is the initial population, p0, times 2, and this is where this one has a fraction for an exponent. And I'll explain that very quickly here now, because I think you'll catch on if I tell you this this way. So let's say I start with only two cells. So I won't have a P0, I just have, well, I could have one or 
one cell and I'm doubling to get my next one. So one, spell split, one cell splits into two to split to four. So if I said, if the doubling time, the time it takes for this cell to double is two hours, then you would have for your time two hours. The doubling is two. This is my doubling time. So if I do two divided by two, that would mean it doubled once, right? So if I said the doubling time was two hours and six hours went by, how many times did it double? So you'd have six divided by two would say I doubled three times, which would give me eight. So that's what we have here. We have, this is some number, this is your final answer, how many you get at the end. So this is the final amount, final amount of cells at some time t. This is your initial number, what you started with. This is a doubling. It's, a, it's saying that these cells are doubling and the exponent to tell you how many times it doubled says how much time has gone by and what is the doubling period. The doubling period can change, right, depending on the type of cell that you have or the type of uh, bacteria you're dealing with. Maybe some take three days to double. So in order to, you, to have any doubling at all, three days would have to go by. Three days divided by three means it doubled once. If I said 12 days went by, then you would say that it doubled 12 divided by three or four times. That's all it is. So time passed divided by the doubling period. So the doubling period. And that's a cell division question. Um, let's do an example. Let's say, okay, I have, I'm starting with a hundred cells. I'll just write some information here. We have a hundred cells. The time that went by is three days. And the doubling period is mm, 12 hours. Okay, so we're just making this up on the spot. Now, you have to be careful when you're working with questions, any word problem questions, to make sure that you're working with the right units. So that means that the amount that I have at some time t, and this time my t is going to be three days. So after three days, what has happened here? Well, I started with 100 cells. They were doubling. The time that went by was three days, but it doubles every 12 hours. So if I'm going to use 12 hours for my denominator here, I have to put the number of days into hours. So 24 hours times three would be 72. So my time up here is going to be 72, which means it's going to double six times. That makes sense, right? Three days every 12 hours. So six times. So I would have 100 times two to the power of six. And two to the power of six is 64. To the five is 32. You should know those numbers by now. And I just add a couple of zeros. And that would be how many cells I have after three days. Okay, so you can make up any word problem you want. So that's the first example, cell division. A second example, pretty similar to it, is a population question. Population growth. So generally, populations grow, unless, of course, you're in a town that's becoming a ghost town or there's some sort of decline in the, the population because of loss of jobs or something like that, but generally populations grow. At least the population of the world does. So you have the population at some time n this time. Yeah, they like to change the numbers. It should, why not t? It could be population at time t. And again, this little sub-zero means the initial population, and it's multiplied by 1 plus r to the power of n. And this time, um, it's not a doubling period. It's just um, the number of years that have gone by. So generally you would say something like the population is growing at, let's say, 5% per year. So you can make up your own word problem. Let's say we're in a small town and the small town has town uh, with an initial population 
of, let's say, 1,500 people. It's just a little town in northern Ontario. And, but it's growing. It has a growth rate. The great rate of growth is 5% per year. You're going to do a lot of word problems in finance section with percentages, so you need to get used to that. And I want to know, what will the population be in five years? Well, let's make it 15 years, just so we have some bigger numbers to work with here. Okay, so what's important here is that I'm not going to add five here, because if I had five to one and raise it to the power, that would say it's growing by 600% a year. I only want 5%. So 5% is the same thing as 0 0.05. Remember that percent means out of 100. So 5 out of 100 is this number. You might want to do that on your calculator if you have trouble with decimals. Okay, so I want to know the population after 15 years. So I can put 15 here. Is the initial population, we had 1,500 people. I like 15, don't I? And 5 this time. Times 1 plus 0 0.05 to the power of 15. So that's 1,500 times 1 1.05 to the 15. So now you'd have to get your calculator out. I just happen to have mine right here. And we'll clear the screen. So I have 1.05 to the power of 15. And then times 1,500. So my population is going to be 3,118, approximately. You can't have 0.39 people, right? No decimal people. So it's approximately 318 after 15 years. And that's population growth. So the key to these ones, of course, is making sure that your rate, this is your rate of change. Let's write some terms on here. Rate of change as a decimal. So make sure you change it to a decimal. N is the time. I would have used T if it was my equation, but this is your textbook using this. And this is your initial population. So the P0s, um, P0 initial population here, initial population here, a rate of change. Okay, so that's the, um, the first two we're going to look at. Now let's go, I'm going to be paper conscious and flip it over here. Let's do um, money growth. Everyone loves money. So you put some money in the bank and you get interest for having it in the bank. Right now the interest rates are really bad, so you probably wouldn't want to put your money in a bank. You might want to invest it in some kind of stock stock market. And this is the equation that you're going to use. Now, this capital A here stands for an amount, amount of money at time n is equal to, P here is your principal, and that's not the guy who's in charge of your school or the woman who's in charge of your school. It's the amount of money that you started with. Right? What you put in the bank, your deposit, initial deposit. Let's call it initial deposit. I is your interest rate, which hopefully is better than what the bank is giving you. And N is time. And generally, time here is in years. It doesn't say that, but it does mean... The, when you say an interest rate of 5% per annum or 4% per annum, that means per year. So this is what we call the compound interest rate formula. It's compounding. So compound interest rate formula. So you put your money in the bank and it grows exponentially like this, right? Hopefully. So let's do an example. Let's make one up. How much money do you have? I don't have a lot. Let's say our principal is going to be um, $5,000. You got some money from your great-grandma. So you have $5,000.
And the bank rate now says, oh, our interest rate is 3.25% per annum. And when you see those words, per annum means per year, right? Per year. And so I'm going to leave it in the bank. Uh, let's say you're 14. Well, most of you are probably 16. Let's say you're going to leave it there for two years. So my N is going to be two years. That's how long I'm going to leave the money there. How much money will I have after two years? Good question. Let's try, try it. So the amount in two years, make sure you're plugging in. You're not just using the N here. You want to put two. Amount after two years is going to be the initial amount. I had $5,000. And it's increasing by 3.25% per annum. Well, 3.25%, remember you have to write that as a decimal. So you move the decimal over two places, so you'd have one. I'll write it out the long way for now, but you'll probably skip this step. 1.0325. That's this divided by 100, because it's out of 100 per cent per annum. Number of years gone by? Two. Okay, so we have 5,000 times 1.0325 to the power of 2. Now you need to call in your calculator. <coughs> Make sure you put your your um, your amount to the power first. That gives me this number, 1.0666, and I'm going to multiply it by 5,000. So I have a measly $5,330 and because it's money, you want two decimals. So 5330.28, that was an eight. Okay, so that's money. We love to see our money grow. We like to put it in the bank. It's always a good idea. Okay, so let's talk about decay now. Decay means to get smaller, right? So obviously these are our things that are growing. We're adding a percentage to it. But if it's decay, that means it's going to go down in value. So let's talk about um, depreciation of assets first. So we just did growth of money. Now we're going to talk about something that depreciates. And what's the most common thing that you may end up buying in your lifetime is a car. As soon as you take a car off the lot, it depreciates, right? So the depreciation formula says... I have the value at some time n, and it's equal to the initial value times 1 minus, and this is the rate of depreciation to the power of n. So again, this is initial value. This is your ending value or final value. This is your rate of depreciation, rate of depreciation, and the N is the time gone by, time in years, unless they give you everything in weeks, and they could say it depreciates by this every week, and then you have to make sure you're matching your rates, rate of change with the time. Okay, so... What are we going to buy? Let's say we have a car. You paid $15,000 for a car. Why do I like 15 so much? Let's say you paid $20,000 for a car. $20,000. And depreciates, the rate of depreciation is 6% uh, per year. How much will the car be worth in, you're going to write, drive it for three years and try to sell it. Okay, so what do we plug in here? So I'm trying to find the amount after three years or the value of the car after three years. And I'm going to put in the original amount I paid for the car, 20,000. One minus now, okay? Remember, because if I multiply it by something bigger, if you're doing a depreciation question and you get your cars worth more than when you bought it, then you know you've made a mistake, right? Always check where problems have to make sense. So it's depreciation at 6% a year, so that's 0 
and to the power of 3. Now that makes sense because if I do 1 minus this, let's write the equation here, <laughs> I'm going to have 0 0.94. So I have 94% of my value after 1 year, but I have to go after 3 years. So again, you would need a calculator. So I have 0 0.094 to the power of 3. You said three years? Yeah, three years. Oh, I put too many decimals in there, didn't I? So 0 0.94 to the power of three is 0 0.83054 times 20,000. And I get my car is now worth $16,611.68. So there's depreciation after three years. So you've lost uh, three thousand three hundred and eighty-eight dollars and thirty-two cents. That's just doing it quickly in my head. Okay, so that's a de a decay question. It's depreciation of a car. Now there's a couple of more that your textbook covers, and one is um, radioactivity or half life half life formulas, <coughs> and that would make a lot of sense if we flip back to the lovely half-life graph that we drew here, right? This is half-life, it's decaying. So there are some substances that have a half-life. And you might have heard of carbon dating, if you're, and that's not a kind of date, like a date, girlfriend, boyfriend date, it's carbon dating. So let's say, I want to know how old this fossil is that I found. And they can measure the amount of carbon in it and de decide how much of it has decayed over certain and they can figure out how old it is. So the half-life formula <clears throat> says n of t is 100 times 1 half to the t over h. So this is half-life of something that you start with, you had 100% of it at this point in time. Now this can change. I don't know why your textbook used 100 here. It could be the mass. I like the equation that goes like this. The mass at time t is the initial mass times a half to the t over h. That's a much better formula than this. This implies that you have 100% of a substance at some time, right? And you can figure out how much is left if you started with 100%. But a lot of the word problems say, oh, you start with 60 grams of something. How long, how much would be left after time and the half-life that goes by? Or the half the time that goes by and the half-life of the substance. <coughs> Sorry. So time that goes by, T, this is like the doubling question. Same kind of explanation needed here. So if I said... Um, three hours went by and it halves every hour, then you would have three times, you would have halved it three times. So you would have an eighth of what you started with. In biology and such, the half-lives can be very big. They can be like, um, you know, 2,800 days or 2,000 years or something. And you'll see those in the word problems. So <clears throat> your job is going to be to figure out one of these variables, given that the half-life of something. Well, let's do an example. Let's say I have a mass. It has 60 grams of a substance. That's my initial mass, which I'm going to put in here. And the half-life of my substance is going to be, let's say, 38 days. And the time that has gone by is 200 days. So the question is going to be, what is the mass after 200 days? So I'd say, well, the mass at 200 days is going to be equal to the initial mass, 60 grams, times 1 half to the power of 200 days divided by 38 days. So this is going to tell you how many times, right? How many times was this 60 grams halved? So I can plug that into my calculator. 200 divided by 38 is 5.26, blah, blah, blah. So I have 
0.5 to the power of that answer and I'm going to get this number 0 0.0260 and then I'm going to multiply it by 60 and it says I'm going to have 1.56 grams 1.56 approximately 1.56 does that make sense now okay so we said if you do 200 divided by 38 that means it halved five a little more than five times so if I take 60 and I take it by half, that's 30. 30, that's 1. 15 is 2. 7.5 is 3. 3.75 is 4. And half of 3.75, something around 1.56. So make sure that your answers make sense. The final one that your textbook uses is light intensity. And this talks about um, if you go underwater what is the um, the amount of light that is there as you go down. Now this makes much more sense to start with 100 because at the surface um, you have 100% of the light. As you go deeper and deeper into the water, the intensity of the light is decreased. So that's why we have a minus here. And there would be some kind of question saying that, well, as you go down every... Um, Every 100 feet, you lose a certain percentage. And so you would plug that percentage in here and figure out your end value for how many feet you've gone down. Okay? So I'm not going to do that question. There's lots of examples in your textbook. I suggest you read the word problems. And if you have a specific problem in your textbook that you want some help with, let me know. I'd be happy to do it for you. Have a good day. Bye.